feel or when we see people, if we, uh, we feel that we can go and speak to them, we go and speak to them. When we feel we are comfortable, we go to them. Or we feel that, okay, this is the right person, right time. We decide the timings. But for God, 24-7 is the timing. Anytime, anywhere. He says, before ministering, God expects, before you speak the word of God, God expects you to come up to that own side. I don't think there will be sufficient of time to give thanks to God for everything that He's done for us. Amen? Amen. More than we could ever think or desire, we will believe God will be more than faithful to us. Hallelujah. Amen. No matter what the enemy had tried to do amongst us, against us, but yet God kept yes. giving us the victory, lifting us up one day at a time. Hallelujah. Amen. God is more than faithful. Amen? Amen. Right, so we are going through the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. Can you read? Uh, we can read up to twelve. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to fish. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hungry and their and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are merciful for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Antoshabari, Unnasabari, Kavarabari, 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 New booming of point of view. Upo Sans of Tegare, at the Kinata in the Ruku, Upina Uchibandipo, General Adan of Haki Haki Puri, the Kyo, Adu Yoki, Matawa Kilsu. Thank you, God. Father, we are come to hear your voice. We are come to hear from your words. There's no greater teacher than you. Teach us your word. And your word. Let it come from the power of science and knowledge. But your word is living and powerful, sharper than any other double We bless your holy name. Give glory upon your praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, we have to understand this, this message. Chapter 5 is something which is very powerful and very important. If you see the Old Testament, when it was finished, it ended with a curse. If you go to Malachi, chapter 12, 4, verse 6. And, and he returned the heart of the father to the children, and the heart of the children to the father. Lest I come and strike the earth in his comes. But we see, in the Beatitudes, we see as Jesus begins to come on and begins to minister to people, preach to people, the first sermon of his, he had been preaching in many places. We read it in the previous chapter, but we see here something very important. God, he begins to speak. The first thing he begins to speak is blessing. But before that, he was preach, preaching about repentance. He was calling people to come, to repent and come and know about the kingdom of heaven. Right? We've seen that. Jesus taking over the ministry of John was the prison. Right? Yes or no? So here we see Jesus. First thing we've got to see it here is that Jesus was the preacher. He is the prince of all preachers. Amen. There's none like him and his word is the most authoritative and most blessed and powerful and living word. Amen. So it is very important that we give heed to what Jesus speaks because ultimately it is what is going to be a blessing into our life. So we got to understand that this words that are written down is not by man, it's by God himself he has spoken this. Secondly is, he knows what he's speaking. 
He knows what he's going to tell. It's not just like we preachers just come and preach what we understand, what we think. But here we, he, the author himself, is speaking about what he is going to do in our lives. So we have to give more heed and attentive to the words of Christ. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And we can see the blessing. And we see here also, as it begins with, and seeing the multitudes. The, we got to see is that Jesus, first of all, when he saw the crowd, <coughs> he, he moved with compassion. The reason was, when he saw the multitudes, he saw them as a shepherd, a sheep without a shepherd. He saw, and he, the scripture says, the shepherd knows his sheep. So we, Jesus, when he saw them, he was so, he came for each and every one of us. He came for mankind. Even today, he seeks for those who are lost. He wants his word to be reached out to those who are lost. Even if it's one, he will live the 99 and go after that one. So here we see he, He's so compassionate and it's, he moves with compassion. And he sees, when he sees the multitude, he, his heart tears, breaks for them. When he saw the people, he saw the people with an omniscient eyes and he saw their conditions. No one cared for them. They were like a sheep without a shepherd. If you see many of them, all that came there was they, everybody needed something, either healing or touch or, you know, they were all totally lost. Today, there are many people who are lost in this world. Thanks be to God that we have Christ in us, in the hope of glory. There are so many people who are lost and God is wanting us to begin to start looking at mankind the way he would look. We got to look through the eyes of Christ, not through our own understanding. We, we, when we feel or when we see people, if we, uh, we feel that we can go and speak to them, we go and speak to them. When we feel we are comfortable, we go to them. Or we feel that, okay, this is the right person, right time. We decide the timings. But for God, 24-7 is the timing. Anytime, anywhere, He can use us. It's all that we got to learn to do. Get tuned to the Holy Spirit <coughs> and ask Him, Lord, what you want me to do, guide me. And He will surely lead us to the right people. Amen? Amen. And there are, God begins, and when we begin to take the heed and help of the Holy Spirit, He begins to move according to His ways. And God's ways are so compassionate, and He sees more than what our naked eyes can see in a person. So when you begin to move with the Holy Spirit, with the help of the Holy Spirit, He will immediately, first of all, He will tell you what that person is going through, what is the need of the heart of that person, how to touch his life, and to let him know that there is a God who is waiting to heal him. There is a God who is waiting to deliver him. There is a God who is waiting to show him the way of salvation. There is a God who is willing to give him the peace that the world cannot give. There are so many in need. So God, he, he, even today, He is so active. But it is for us to be attentive to His voice. <laughs> so we see at the moment He sees the multitude, He begins to move with compassion. And the next thing that I want you to look at this is, the first is He sees the multitude and seeing the multitude. Next is He went up on a mountain. Okay. You know, many a times, we don't give so much of importance for all these things. Have you ever thought about it? why? You know, it was, it was so amazing when the Lord was teaching me last night. I, we all have read the scripture. But did we ever think why Jesus went down on top of the mountain? Did we ever think about it? Huh? Yeah, another mountain. Like, he always has a habit of going on to mountain. But if you see, there is significance for everything that is written down. The place from which these blessings were delivered is worthy to be noted. He went up unto a, into a mountain. That means he ascended and elevation is enough for our purpose. Of course, this is mainly because of the accommodation of the people on the hillside. And one most important thing is why he went on top of the mountain is if you see Jesus always if when we read the gospel, when we read whatever Jesus did, every time in the night when he went, he went lonely up the mountain and he prayed. Mountain is a high place. And also it's very important that we also learn to 
goes to the high realm. That is, in other words, to the spirit realm. We need to have a fellowship with God. You, can, you don't have to go to the mountain to pray, but in your room you can reach that mountain. Amen. You can be in the presence of God. Hello. You can be in that Mount Sinai. You can be in that Mount Sinai. You can be in that Mount Torah. You can be in the Mount of Olives. You see, everything where, even where was Golgotha on the Mount of? Hello, where was the Mount of Golgotha? The Calvary, where was it? It was also on a mountain, right? It was on a mountain. Even Calvary was on a mountain. You see, Mount Sinai, what happened in Mount Sinai? Moses went, and what did he get from there? He got the commandments, right? He had time with God. Then we see Zion. Mount Zion is referred as a church, right? Mount Zion is known as church. Today, who are we? We are the church. We are the Mount Zion. Where God's presence is. Where you are, that place can become a mountain. Hello? You don't have to climb a mountain. <coughs> many people climb mountains, hills. They go to so many places thinking that God will meet them. But thanks be to God that we got such an awesome God that he has come to live, willing to dwell with us. And he makes the place where you are itself as Mount Zion. As a Mount Sinai. Amen. He has made that place for you. And next is Mount of Olives. What, what does Mount Olives represent? The ascension of Christ. So mountain has a great significance. And what God is trying to tell us is, hey, before, before you speak, first is you've got to learn to ascend. You have to learn to come up. Come up to the mountain where I am. Come up to my presence. What we do is, many of us, what we do is we just take God for so granted. We don't have time for him sometimes. We just get up, okay, we have our own excuses. And then we just rush and come. But you see, Jesus, no matter how tired, how much, how great ministry he had. But still in the night, he went up, he fellowshiped with his father. Then he came down and then he ministered. So before ministering, God expects, before you speak the word of God, God expects you to come up to the bound sign. God expects you to be in that bound sign because he wants to speak to you his word. He wants you to have that fellowship with him. So it is important that we learn to ascend before we descend the word. Before we release the word of God, he wants us to come to high places. High places where every activity takes place. Hello. It's always in the spirit realm. After 12, after 1, after 2 o'clock, a man of God was saying, after 2 o'clock, till 5 o'clock, the spirit realm is very active. Actually, it starts after midnight, around after 12 o'clock onwards. The, but 2 o'clock onwards is highly active by the demonic forces. And you know the Satanist people, what they do? They spend time from 12 o'clock till 5 o'clock. They are awake and they keep praying and chanting. In an, you know why they do that? Because they say the Christians sleep at that time. Because when the Christians are sleeping, it's more easy for them to be active. Because when you are active, they cannot do anything. When a Christian is active, the demonic forces cannot do anything. That's why many of us, you know, we see we get time, we get bad dreams, we get things, we get, you know, disturbed. And, you know, we feel that something's going to happen to us. All these nightmares and all. And, you know, you see people messing up, lives getting messed up as well. When is it? Mostly in the night times. When? You are relaxed, you are going to bed, you're, or when you think night is the time for you to relax. Actually, that's the time for you to be more active. A Christian has to be more active in the night time and spend time in prayer. At least for one or two hours. You know, we got to learn to fight the realm in the night, not in the day. Day, they don't come out. They know. We have, the moment you get up, 
you are very active. You know what? You start speaking, you start praying, you start calling the name of the Lord. So they cannot do anything much. Jesus, that's why every time he went, he went in the night. He went in the night. He went alone. That's the time he could listen to his father. He could see what's happening. He could decide with the father what to do. And night time is the best time to be in the presence of God. I tell you, we have been enjoying the presence these few days. It's so easy for me to pray. I'm flowing. It's, it's amazing, wonderful presence. Without my knowledge, 2, 2.30, I'm awake. I get up and I'm, sometimes it's the whole night I'm awake. I would tell them, okay, go to bed. And it, it is something wonderful. Uh, uh, you know, the presence, the room itself, it's, it's open heavens. I can see the things. It's so wonderful in the night times to pray and see God, God's presence in the early hours. Hallelujah. Jesus wants us to be on the mountain. He was, that's why he says, hey, come up. He went up the mountain. Is because there's a significance. And he, before we preach, we minister. Remember one thing. You've got to go to that high level. You've got to go to the place of the Lord. Hallelujah. Next is, he says, he went up on the mountain and he was seated. <coughs> and his disciples came to him. The fifth important thing that I want to speak about is, you know, the position, the way he came. Usually what Jesus did, did he ever sit down in the synagogues and preaching? We don't see that in the Bible. He came, he stood, he read the Bible, he closed the scroll, he preached, then he came and sat down. But the first time we see Jesus sitting down before he speaks. You know, every action in this has such a powerful impact. And God wants us to understand this. Listen, whatever you do, I am in you and I am with you. And I want you to know what authority you have been. Usually, as per the Jewish tradition, the teacher sits and the students stand up. Actually, I should be sitting and God should be standing. <laughs> but Jesus, that's why he came to the mall. And he sat. He was showing his authority <laughs> to the people. He's wanting them to know, hey, listen, I am not an ordinary person. What you have seen and heard is just nothing, but I'm showing, I want you to know, see something much more of who I am. And he wanted to reveal himself to mankind. He, that's why what they called him, they called him Rabbi. Rabbi means teacher. Rabbi, that means teacher. They, because teacher is a highly honored. Nikodem is such a highly learned man. What did he come and call him? He said, Rabbi. What is it? How can I enter into the kingdom of heaven? So teachers are highly respected people. And here we see Jesus showing his authority. He comes and sits down. So to let the people understand, hey, listen, I'm not just a preacher, I'm also a teacher. I've come to teach you my word. I've come to teach you what is there for you, what is in store for you. And I want you to learn and I want you to receive it. And we got, and people, he wanted the people's attention. It's not that he wanted the respect. Respect was already there, that's why people ran. But he wanted them to know, hey, listen, I'm not preaching a sermon now. I'm teaching you something which is very important, which is going to be a blessing for your, your generation, for you and your generation. So we see Jesus, he sat down. He sat as an authoritative teacher, a judge, awarding the blessings of the kingdom or a king on his throne. He sat as a refiner and his word was as a fire. He was like a, sitting down as a refiner because his word is a fire. So when you sit, when you speak the word, there is something that goes out of you when you take the word of God and when you allow the Holy Spirit to minister through you. There's a fire of God that flows from you. There's something that's happened. That's why the word of God says, this word, the word, word of God is living at Powerful, sharper than any other 
So every time when you speak the word of God, something should be deposited in the people's life. Something should happen in the spirit. Something, there should be a connection. They sh God will not speak for the sake of speaking. When he speaks, he does something in people's life. Hallelujah. He is, his word is not empty. His word is not powerless. His word is not lifeless. It is powerful. It is like a hammer breaking Amen. the wall. So when the word of God comes, it has to do something in our life. Somewhere, something that is hidden, God will break that for you and me. Amen. So God here, he shows, he sat as a refiner and then allowed his word to be as a fire. And next we see is, then he opened his mouth. Earlier chapter, did Jesus open his mouth? When we read chapter 4, did we see him speaking? <coughs> Hello? Yes or no? The why it says, and then he opened his mouth. He climbed up the mountain. Second, what did he do? First, he saw the multitude. Second, he climbed the mountain. Third, what he did? He sat. And fourth, what he did? He opened his mouth. Why it says that he opened his mouth? It was to let us know. In the Old Testament, we see before, God spoke to the use his prophets as his mouthpiece. Right? His prophets were his mouthpiece. But here we see God himself speaking out of his own mouth. That's why it says, Matthew 4, 4, what it says? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's what it says. And he opened his mouth because the words that is going to come is not from an ordinary person but the words that is going to come that we are going to read, that we are going to hear is not of an ordinary man but it is from God himself from the Son of God himself the Word himself which is going to impact our life. It is not an ordinary written letter. It is it is the living God himself who is speaking to the multitude. And today when we read the word and it says and he opened his mouth, uh, believe that God is going to speak to you. We got to learn to receive the word as Christ himself is speaking to us, not a man. Hallelujah. Because when the word of God is spoken, it is God's word. It is the living word. It should bring a blessing into our life. Amen. Next, what it says. He opened his mouth and taught them. What did you do? He taught them. He didn't preach to them. He taught them. What did he teach? The first word of our Lord's grace of the sermon is what? What is it? What is the first word? Blessed are the, the So the first word that the first word that came out of the mouth of God Himself was what? Blessing. John three seventy. How many? How many of us know that? But John three. God did not send His Son to. But to bless. to give eternal life. See, Jesus came into the world not to condemn, but to give eternal life to the so believer. That's why he wanted to confirm his words. All that he's been to. That's why the very first word what he said is blessed. Him. He wants all of us to know today, hey, you're blessed. Tell your neighbors. You are blessed. You are blessed. God says you are blessed. You are blessed. No matter who says what, I don't care. My Lord tells me that I am blessed. It is immaterial. 
word of God is more valuable and it is yes, yea, and amen. If the Lord has said, blessed are you, you are blessed. Amen. And nobody can change that. Amen. Nobody can cancel it. Only you can do it. That is if you reject the word. But here, first thing we see is God, he says, blessed. And then what he says? <laughs> Blessed are the who are in the spirit. Why did God say that? You know, there are two important things that Jesus speaks in the gospel. You know, two important things that we always have to remember. One is blessed and the other one is believe. He says, if you believe. You see, a number of times Jesus used that word believe. If you will only believe. If you will only believe. Blessed are you. Blessed are they. You know, blessed, always these two words are the most important key for every Christian. When we speak to people also, learn that these two are the key for every doors in the lives to be open to receive Christ. You are blessed. There's a blesser. He's willing to bless you. But only you have to do is believe. Believe and you shall receive. Believe and you shall be blessed. Hello? These are the two keys to touch the lives of us. He came to show us that, listen, if you believe this word, if you believe him, you will see the blessings. Because he is a blesser. He wants to turn our curse into blessing. Blessed are the poor and the spirit. The Bible does warn us against being empty and impoverished in our souls and urges us to seek spiritual riches and sin. That's why Jesus said, Matthew 6.21 For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there also your heart will be. That's why God wants to understand and make us know as a listen. Your blessing is where your heart is. Where is your heart? Where is your spirit? And that's why it said, blessed are the poor in the spirit. spirit. Poor in the spirit means what? It does not relate with the circumstance of our life in this world. Oh, poor people. We use the word term poor. It means humble. Blessed are those who are humble in the spirit. Blessed are those who always would say, Lord, I need you, O God. Without you, I am nothing. God, I need more of you. Lord, I need more of your presence. Lord, I need more. I need to know more of your word. No matter how much you know the word, no matter how much you've studied the Bible, no matter how many times you've read the Bible, no matter how much of revelation you and I have, we got to understand is that the more we read, the more we need of him. Amen. Amen. We, are, we can only be complete because when we reach there, Till we are in this earth, we are people who need God. We cannot be haughty, we cannot be proud. Oh, I'm 20 years in ministry, I'm 40 years in ministry, I know the word of God, you're trying to teach me. Yes, many a times, even we all have to be taught the word, no matter how many years. That's why when you keep reading the word again and again, you keep getting new, new revelations. Yes or no? The mysteries keep on opening up, right? Yes or no? So same way, none of us can ever say that we know the word. The more we say, Lord, I need to know more of you. Paul, what did he say? He said, there's still so much that I have to know, right? Though he knew everything, yet what he said? I still have not yet learned. There's still so much for me to know. There's so much that we all have to learn. We have to learn to be humble in our spirit. Everyone say, I have to be, uh, to be humble in my spirit. God expects us to be humble and gentle in our spirit. We've got to learn to be poor. Being poor means, oh Lord, I'm a beggar. No, it's not that I'm you're a beggar. You say, Lord, I need more of you. I need to know more of your word, God. Next one he says, blessed are the poor. Poor in the spirit. Mm. 
But theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We must humble in our spirits and if we put the word in the place humble or poor, you will understand what it means. As I explained to you, someone can turn to James 4, 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So always, no matter how much we know Bible knowledge, whatever we know, no matter how much of experience we have, we always learn to understand this listen. We are not greater than God. We are not greater than anybody because everyone who is in Christ has Christ in them. Amen? Everybody has an anointing and the anointing that they have, what it does? It teaches them, right? We all have an Does the word of God say that? Anointing teaches everything. You, you and I, we all have the anointing. And who else do we have? Do we have the Holy Spirit in us? Yes. What does it say? And I will send you another comforter who shall lead, teach you, he shall guide you, right? You have a great teacher in you. So if I say I'm better than Ashwin, that is right. That is, I'm trying to say, hey, Ashwin, no matter what, you have the Holy Spirit also. I don't care. I know more than you. It's impossible in the children for a child of God. In kingdom of heaven, in kingdom of God, nobody is greater than the other person because the other person also has the same Holy Spirit that is in you. Hallelujah. So never ever, that's why, never ever think we are better than another person. We always have to learn to us humble. The moment you think you know you are better than somebody, pride is in you. You got to deal with that pride. You got to break yourself. You got to learn to humble yourself. And those who humble, their reward is what? Kingdom of heaven is theirs. In other words, when we humble ourselves, we can experience heaven. You can experience heaven wherever you are. You can have the divine presence. You can experience the angels. You can you can really live the life that God wants you to live. When you humble, you can really feel God. You can hear His voice. You can hear the angels. You can ex see the angels. You can experience heaven on earth. That's why it's, we go to every day start seeking the Lord. The more you seek and the more you long, the more you break yourself. That's why it says, until and unless a grain of wheat falls onto the ground and it dies, it cannot bear. We have to learn to every day die to ourselves, break ourselves. No matter who says what, no matter what qualification or what we have or position, position, all this doesn't take us to heaven. It is only his grace, by His grace, His love, that we can enter into the heaven. Amen? Amen. Next one. Blessed are the... <coughs> blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The term mourn means to experience deep grief. In keeping with this theme of spiritual blessedness, Jesus seems to indicate that the mourning is due to grief over sin. The people who agree with God about evil and their own hearts can attain an invaluable, invaluable state of blessedness due to the comfort they receive from communion with the Holy Spirit. Jesus called the Holy Spirit the Comforter. John 14, 16. And I will pray the Father and He will give you another network that He may abide with you forever. 14:26. For the help of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to you your remembrance, all things that I have heard, I said to you. Second Corinthians 1 4. Who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. Look the comfort which, which we <coughs> ourselves are comforted by God. Amen. 
Here we see that the Spirit comforts all those people, right? In other words, what God is trying to speak to us is, Blessed are those who mourn us. What He sees us, we should learn to, if we make any mistakes, if we commit any sin, God expects us that we are walking with God to mourn, to have that grief. Like when you lose someone, your dear one, how will you mourn? How will you grieve? When you commit a sin, you should have that grief in you. You should feel that, <coughs> that much sad, that much sorrow should strike your spirit man. You should live, you should feel that something disastrous has happened. You should like how you would just imagine your very loud person has passed away. What is how will you mourn? What is the pain? Have you, we all have experienced one way or the other of someone in our family is left us and not. We have experienced that pain, yes or no? Same way, God, when we sin, God expects us to have that intensity of pain and grief within us. When you have that intensity of grief and pain, you know what? The Holy Spirit begins to come for us. And if we lose a loved one, Will we want ever see another loved one lost? Will we? Hello? We will be very cautious about others, right? So we become more concerned. Okay, hello, how about you? Even if they come half an hour late, we are very concerned. <coughs> Where are you all okay? All fine? Even if it just rain comes, usually when rain comes, it's not doing too far, but suddenly after grief takes place, Suddenly lightning and thunder, you know, immediately, you stop panicking, you immediately call, Hello, how are you? Where are you? You are safe? You are okay? Yes or no? <coughs> Tsunami hit some place, but people started calling all over that city. Which place is nothing connected, but why they called? Because they, those who lost their dear ones know what it is. They're concerned whether they lost one, their loved ones are lost again, because they know the pain. That's why when you go into that grief and pain, when you sin and when you go to that situation, you will never want to do it again. <clears throat> and the Holy Spirit helps you. Blessed are those who mourn. God expects us to be people. When, even if we, for example, even if we say something against one another, you greet the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit will greet when you know that you and I have to learn to grieve more and cry out to the Lord. We have to cry and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I will never do it again. I will never wound another person. Even my words, through my words action, I will never do it. Again, Holy Spirit help me. And He will give you that strength. He will help you. He will, he will guide you. He will strengthen you. Blessed are those who mourn. Why? What happens to them? For they shall be comforted. For they shall be comforted. That's why when you covet, when you plead, when you covet to God, and when the Holy Spirit comforts you, there's a peace. There's a peace and you don't remember. You you don't next time you don't worry about anything. You know why? Because you know God is with you. And you will not allow yourself to go through those paths again. Hallelujah. Yeah. Next is blessed are the meek for they will inherit the The meek are those who are gentle, humble and unassuming, simple in faith and patient in the face of every affront. Without any pre pre precepts of the gospel, they imitate the meekness of the Lord who says, Learn from me, for I am meek and humble at heart. Who said that? Jesus, right? He says, Learn from me, for I am humble and meek at heart. God wants us to be simple, like the little children. You know why God can speak to the little children more easily than to us adults? I've been, I've been asking God, Lord, I want this, I want to do that, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want this thing, I want, I want to, Lord, see the manifestation of your glory, I want these things to happen. Simple, but to be like a child. 
You just see a child never bothers what who what it is. It's very pure and heart clean. They don't have any presumption assumption about anybody. They don't mark a person, or they don't even say, "Oh, so and so, I'm not going to go to that uncle, or I'm not going to go to that aunt or that." No, a child is a child. Anyone it will run to, right? Yes or no? They don't even parents when you whack. After a few minutes, immediately the child come and hug you. The other child, oh, you're a bad dad. You're I'm not going to come to you. Bad mom, I'm not going to come to you. He put comes in the night. <laughs> <laughs> they come. Why? Right? That moment, spur of that moment, they say, but like what happens? <laughs> they need you. Then after a few moments, they forget. They come, then they start laughing, jumping. Playing around with you. That's what God expects us also to be. Never ever have anything against anybody. And learn to be simple. The more simple we are with one another, the more blessed we are. Let us say, the more simple we are with one another, the more blessed I am. He expects us to be meek. Example we see about Mary, Luke 138. Then Mary said, Behold the maid servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. What did Mary say? Let it be as according to the word. word. Did she go around and say, Ah, oh, you know, <laughs> angel came, angel spoke to me, what, you know. The Savior is going to lose me. I ain't going to consider. Did Mary speak about it? Forget all that she conceived. She gave birth. Did you go? At, did she at any way birth say, Hello? Do you know who I am? I am the mother of your Savior, okay? Did she say that? When the angels came, when the angels heard about the birth of Christ, right? They came. What did Mary do? Ah, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking. Yeah, yes, yes, I know, I know. I know my son. Did he say that? Did she say that? She listened to them. Pondered over them. Meditated over them. She kept it in her heart. When they went to the temple, when Jesus was there, Jesus said, Don't you know that I should take care of my father's business? Ah, yeah, I know. I know who you are. But don't forget, I'm the one who gave birth. Did Jesus, Mary say that to Jesus? Hello? We means, little we get means we want, we want people, the whole world to know. Right? Yes or no? Position. Oh, I, God spoke to me. One angel comes and visits us. I don't know what is going to happen. Imagine an angel comes over here now. The angel of the Lord just decides what's going to happen here. I'm sure. Next moment you'll get out of this place. You have to be calling every yeah, fingers and mouth will be itching to call everyone and say, This is what happened. See? The angel of the Lord came. Full gold as oh, we could see XP everything. We will go or oh, it spoke to me. I heard his voice. He is like this. We go on describing and the God. That one experience will be till your death. Yes, you'll be so satisfied till the end. But God says, hey, no matter what experience you have with me, listen to me, humble and me. Whatever God does in us and through us, it's not because of our abilities. Amen. If the blind see, if the deaf hear, the lame walks, whatever happened, it's not yours or my ability, it's his ability. I'm just, you're just a vessel that he has chosen, like Mary, to be used for his glory. Amen? Amen. So God expects us to humble and be meek. So to sum it up, always remember one thing, what first thing is, when people, when you see anybody, Learn to allow the Holy Spirit to move in us. Begin to see people through the eyes of God. Okay? How Jesus would look at that person. How? No matter how wicked that person or the what it is. How will how God will look at that person? Because he came for the wicked. 
He didn't come for the righteous. Did God come for the righteous? He didn't come. He came for the wicked. He came for the sinners. So look at people when you see with the eyes of compassion. Because when you see with the eyes of compassion, then the door opens for God to enable you to elevate you, to take you up to the mountain, fill you with this word, and then make you open your mouth and speak and allow this word to come as a refining fire, that they may be refined and that they be sanctified, that they may be set free, and that God be glorified in their lives. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. But for that to happen, we need to right. learn to be. The three steps, what we saw is, blessed are the poor. That means we have to learn to always say, Lord, I still don't know much of God. Lord, I, there is still so much for me to learn. There's so much more I need of you. Every day, seeking Him, longing for Him, longing for His Word, longing for His presence. How the poor man, what he does, he always keeps seeking and asking. The poor man will not get anything if he doesn't ask. When he asks, he gets it. And he keeps seeking for the right place where he can get. <laughs> will the poor man in the desert ask for food? Hello? Believe me. He will not. He will go to the place where there is food available, right? So he will search for that place. Same way, we have to learn to seek. And that's why he said, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Nor can it shall be open. So let's have this principle in our lives. And let the kingdom of heaven be manifested in us and through us. So when people see us, may they see Christ in us, the hope of the world. Hallelujah. Bless you. I hope you are blessed with the word. And we shall continue next week.